Hi, welcome to Astro 101, The Sun and Its Neighbors. I'm Professor Bart Netterfield. Today, we are going to take a tour of the solar system. Now, last week, we looked at our place in the universe. We live on the Earth, a tiny planet orbiting the, a giant sun, but the sun is a tiny star in a galaxy of 100 billion stars, and our galaxy is a tiny galaxy in an immense ga universe of trillions of galaxies. Today, we're, we're going to come all the way back and look at what our local neighborhood looks like, starting with the sun and going out all the way to the Kuiper Belt and beyond. Now, I want to start with this. Now, this right here is a, is a still from a really fantastic website called www.solarsystemscope.com. Now, this website gives a really fantastic set of simulations of what the, universe, what the solar system is like. So if you want to play around with it, it's a great way to learn how the solar system works. Now, here, this right here is just a still. What we have here in the middle is the sun, followed by the four terrestrial planets, the four planets closest to the sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Now, each of these planets, we'll see in a moment, are orbiting the sun, um, too slowly to see in this, in this, in this moment. Um, now, this, these orbits are all roughly circular, as you can see, but not quite. You see the orbit of Mercury is just a little bit offset from the sun. Um, Venus and, and Earth are much more circular, much closer to center on the sun. And then Mars, again, is, is offset. The, the shapes of these orbits are, are, are a shape called an ellipse. Um, and a, a circle is a type of ellipse, but, these, but ellipses can become less circular. Well, let's go ahead and move on here. So... If we actually look at it in time, we can see, let's speed up the time here to maybe, I don't know, uh, 21 days per second. So now we're moving much, much faster. We can see the Earth actually orbiting the sun. Now, the next thing you notice when you look at this is that Mercury is orbiting a lot faster than Venus, which is moving a lot faster than the Earth, which is moving a lot faster than Mars. In fact, the closer you get to the sun, the faster the orbital speeds are. So um, now each... Each time the Earth goes around the Sun once is one year. That's how long it takes for the Earth to orbit the Sun. So uh, since I started that, it's been about six months. And we're moving on here, finally, nine months. And a little further, we get to a year there. Now, the relative positions you can see from this of the planets is continuously changing. Here, Venus is passing close to the Earth and moving further away. Um, what this means is, is if you want to send a space probe to a distant planet, there are better and worse times to do it. If you're, for example, sending a probe to Mars, you'd like to do it when, when the Earth is actually getting fairly close to Mars. You can see Earth is catching up to Mars, and pretty soon it'll be pretty close. You want to set your launch time so that the path of a, of a satellite is optimal for getting from the Earth to the planet. Now... You notice that all of the all of the planets are, are orbiting in what in what is essentially the same plane. They're all like they're all orbiting on a table. Not quite. You can see that there's there's slight tilts between them, but they, we call this plane the plane of the ecliptic. It's really quite interesting. All the planets orbiting the same direction. All the planets orbiting in the same plane, the the ecliptic plane. Um, now we notice that all the planets are orbiting the same direction. If we zoom here zoom in here down into the sun, we see the sun is rotating in the same direction that all the planets are orbiting. So this is, it, as we try to understand how the solar system works, we're going to need to try to understand this. Why does the sun spin the same way as all the planets are orbiting, and why are all the planets orbiting in the same plane? So these are the four planets closest to the sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. If we zoom out, we can get out to where we start to be able to see Jupiter. Jupiter quite a bit further out there, moving very slowly. And then beyond that, Saturn moving even slower still. In between Jupiter and the Earth, or in Jupiter and Mars rather, we have Ceres, which is one of the dwarf planets. These things are moving much too slow, so let's speed it up to maybe going, I don't know, one year per second. So now, um, every second, a year has gone by. Now we can actually see in uh, better form the, or the motions of Jupiter and Saturn. Out here, as we look further out, we see Uranus. Zooming even further still, we see Neptune. Those are the four um, Jovian planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Down in the center, now no longer visible, are the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Now, just like, um, just like 
the inner planets are, op are, are orbiting the same plane, the terrestrial, pl the, the Drovian planets are also orbiting in the same plane as the inner planets. So all eight planets orbiting in the same plane called the ecliptic plane, all going the same direction. Now, the, the planets we see in brown are the dwarf planets. Um, Pluto, of course, being the most famous of them. Uh, and then, but there's some other ones that have been discovered since then, like Aries, Makey Makey, Hime. Um, they do not orbit in the ecliptic, by and large. Their orbits are much more irregular. But nonetheless, they all are going the same direction. So, let's summarize what we learned about the orbits of the planets. First of all, the planets all orbit in the same plane. This plane is called the ecliptic plane. The planets all orbit in the same direction. The sun rotates in the same direction that the planets rotate. And finally, the planets all have elliptical orbits that repeat the same orbit over and over and over again. The closer the planet is to the sun, the faster it orbits. Mercury, very quick, 89 days for a, for a relative year. Neptune, much, much longer, hundreds of years to go around the sun once. So let's, whoa, okay. Let's go ahead and meet um, the planets. We have here Mercury, which is the closest planet to the sun. Uh, now Mercury, if you look at it, it's, well, it looks like a cratered rock. Um, no atmosphere. Uh, it's got a rocky, rocky exterior with a large iron core. Because it's the closest to the sun, on the sunward side, it gets incredibly hot, over 400 degrees Celsius. Now remember, melt, lead melts at you know 327 degrees Celsius. So if you had a piece of electronics sitting in the daytime on Mercury, it would just all melt, let alone the plastic. It would have melted long before that even. Um, Mercury has no moons. In fact, it kind of looks like a moon itself. Um, now, I didn't mention this, but it's hot in the daytime, 425 Celsius. At night, because there's no atmosphere to keep the heat in, it gets very, very cold, down to minus 170 degrees Celsius. So not the best place to live. Um, only two probes have ever visited um, Mercury, uh, Mariner 10 in the 70s, and finally Messenger uh, in, in the 2010s. Venus is the second planet out. Now Venus is, it's a pretty horrible place. Um, if you thought Mercury was bad, no air, incredibly hot in the daytime, incredibly cold in the nighttime, Venus is worse. Um, Venus, now, it's a, it's, you seem like, oh, Venus should be great. It's about the same size of the Earth. It should be pretty similar. Um, well, Venus, first of all, has lots of volcanoes, like the Earth. That's, you know, the Earth has lots of volcanoes, relatively speaking. Venus has lots of vol volcanoes. Earth has an atmosphere. Venus has an atmosphere. However, Venus's atmosphere is incredibly thick carbon dioxide. In fact, it's so thick that it's hard to walk through it because it's so thick. Um, well, it's somewhere in between air and water in terms of how it would feel to walk through it. Um, runaway greenhouse effect from all that carbon dioxide has made it incredibly hot, even hotter than mercury. It is 460 degrees Celsius everywhere all the time, day, night, um, summer, winter. 460 degrees Celsius. Remember again, that's a that's over 100 degrees warmer than the melting temperature of lead, let alone plastic or anything else like that. Incredibly, incredibly horrible place. It rains acid. Um, now, there have been a few, many probes sent there. The Soviet Union sent a number of probes to, to Venus. They only lasted a short time. Be, after all, it's an incredibly horrible, horrible place. But uh, it's kind of remarkable. Um, some interesting things about um, Venus, it, it or orbits very, 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 very slowly. So days are incredibly long, and it actually orbits backwards compared to everything else. So that, I mean, Venus orbits so slowly, it's almost like it's not rotating at all. Did you catch that error? He said orbits. He should have said rotates. Completely different. Rotates very, very slowly. Rotates backwards. Earth. Well, what do we say? Earth, 
fantastic place. Uh, it's about the same size as Venus. It has lots of volcanoes, but that's kind of where the similarities end. The atmosphere on Earth is a combination of oxygen and nitrogen, nitrogen being most of the atmosphere, and then a, and then a, a smaller fraction of oxygen. It's got large oceans which serve to regulate the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere so that it doesn't have runaway greenhouse effect. Um, the surface of Earth is heavily impacted by life. So life really is the dominant thing that shapes the surface of the Earth now. Um, Earth has one very large moon, and it's a really, really great place to live. The last thing to note is that Earth, as you can see here, Earth, its rotation is kind of tipped on its side by about 23 degrees. And it's orbiting quite quickly compared to either Mercury or Venus. This tip produces significant seasons, and we'll be learning about that as the semester progresses. After Earth comes Mars. Now, Mars is probably the second best place in the solar system to hang out. That is to say, compared to the Earth, unbelievably horrible. Uh, don't forget, the nicest place outside the Earth is vastly worse than the worst place on Earth. And Mars would be the second best place in the solar system, and it is horrible. Now, the surface of Mars has a lot of extinct volcanoes. It no longer, the volcanoes are no longer active. And it's got an atmosphere, but it's a very, very thin carbon dioxide atmosphere. So far thinner than you would need to, to, to breathe. Um, it's, it once had oceans, but the oceans have all evaporated now. And there's no evidence that there's any life on Mars, which is not surprising. Um, Mars has two very small moons. Uh, it has, um, polar, it has ice or dry ice, ice caps at the poles. Um, a 25 degree tilt, almost as much as the Earth's, uh, means it also has significant seasons. Um, many probes and landers have gone to, to Mars um, because it is sort of the second best place. But, well, I wouldn't want to take a vacation there. So, in summary, we have these, the terrestrial planets. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And here they are um, in the correct relative size. They're small, they're relatively small, they're rocky, they have relatively thin or no atmospheres. Um, I mean, even Venus's thick atmosphere is nothing compared to the other planets. Um, there's very few moons, and they're made from heavy elements, iron cores, um, rocky crusts. The next planet after um, the terrestrial planets is Jupiter. Now, Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system. Let's bring it in. Yeah, okay, whoa, 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 that's too big. Um, let me shrink it down. Um, okay, yes, that's that's better. Okay, Jupiter, and okay, the terrestrial planets are down there now, good, okay. Uh, wow, Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system, and you can see compared to the terrestrial planets, it's, 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 it's quite enormous. Um, it has a very thick gaseous atmosphere. Um, they used to call these things the gas giants, but that's not really right. Now, because they're not really entirely gas, there's a very thick gaseous atmosphere, but as you go down into it, you end, as the pressure builds, you end up with liquid hydrogen and finally solid metallic hydrogen um, in, in the core. Uh, there's probably in the very core uh, an Earth-sized rocky core, but of course it's really hard to know that. It has very faint rings. There are many, many moons, more than 60 have been uh, detected so far, going down to very small sizes. And uh, Jupiter is a really cool place. So there's been a number of probes that have visited Jupiter. Right now, the Juno probe is currently in orbit around Jupiter, taking pictures, looking at, at the moons, uh, measuring the magnetic fields and the gravitational forces, and trying to learn more about the structure of Jupiter. Jupiter is really fantastic. So after Jupiter, next one out um, is uh, Saturn. Uh, as you can see, Saturn has absolutely gorgeous rings. Um, now, Saturn is very much like, uh, very much like Jupiter in structure, um, with the thick gaseous atmosphere, the, the liquid hydrogen, and the rocky core down in the center. Um, it also, like Jupiter, has many, many moons, more than 60 again known to date. Um, and again, many probes, several probes have visited um, Saturn. Most recently was Cassini, which was there for over a decade, orbiting Jupiter, uh, taking pictures, sorry, ordering, orbiting Saturn, taking pictures of the planets um, was a really, really cool mission. So we'll be seeing more from Saturn as, this, as the semester progresses. Saturn is just a really gorgeous 
planet, especially those rings. Now, the rings, turn out the rings are the thinnest thing in the universe. Or sorry, it's this thing in the solar system, at least, that I that we know of. They're something like 100 meters tall at, at thick, but then the width is much, much wider than the Earth. Um, thousands and thousands of miles across. So if you tip Saturn just right, you can, yeah, there, you can see the, the rings basically disappear. But because um, Saturn is tipped by 20 some degrees, we get a spectacular view of Saturn and Saturn's rings. So that's great. Saturn is wonderful. Going out after Saturn, the next planet is Uranus. Now Uranus, that's not going to fall on me, is it? It should be, it should, it should be fine. Anyway, the next planet after Sa Jupiter and Saturn is Uranus. Uranus, as you can see, is quite a bit smaller than the other Jovian planets. Um, it is the coldest planet in the solar system, even colder than Neptune, probably because of some internal things going on with the two planets. It's got a small rocky core and a thick water plus ammonia and methane mantle. Um, unlike Jupiter and Saturn, which have, uh, which have a lot of hydrogen, um, Uranus and Neptune uh, have a lot of water and ammonia. Uh, it's got a, a thick hydrogen helium atmosphere above that. And the most remarkable thing about Uranus is that its orbital axis is tipped by 98 degrees. So it does not spin in the same orbit as the same plane as the, as does not spin in the ecliptic plane, in the same plane as the, as the orbits. Um, in fact, there's times during the year when Uranus's North Pole is pointed directly at the sun, and there's times during the year when the South Pole is pointed directly at the sun. So very, very unusual, something we're gonna have to understand as we try to understand how the solar system all works. After Uranus comes the furthest planet from the sun, which is Neptune. Neptune is basically Uranus's twin in many, many ways. The same kind of rocky core, the same kind of ammonia, water, and uh, ice mantle. Um, its rotation axis is only tipped by 28 degrees, not near as extreme. Uh, does not have as many moons as Uranus. Um, Neptune, unusually, has the strongest winds in the solar system, up to 2100 kilometers per hour. So those are the Jovian planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. They're all, compared to the terrestrial planets, large. They all um, have small uh, rocky cores with a liquid mantle and thick gaseous atmospheres. Um, they have many moons. They're made from much lighter elements than the terrestrial planets. Re recollect the terrestrial planets all have large iron cores and rocky mantles. Um, the Jovian planets are comprised of lighter elements. Jupiter and Saturn, the larger ones, have a lot of hel hydrogen and helium. Uh, and then the, the ice giants, uh, Uranus and Neptune, comprise of, of water and other ices. Um, so these are the Jovian planets. Uh, we can send those away. Oh, away. Okay, so now, next I want to talk about the moon systems in the solar system. We'll start with the Earth. As you know, the Earth has a large moon which orbits it. So here we go back to this uh, planet scope simulation of the Earth and the moon system, and we can see the moon orbiting the Earth. It takes about 28 days for the moon to go around the Earth once. It orbits in a plane which is tipped slightly from the ecliptic by about something like seven degrees. Now this is going to become important later when we uh, try to understand eclipses. In the meantime, um, it, it, we can notice that the, that the moon orbits the Earth in the same direction that the Earth, Earth turns and in the same direction that the Earth orbits the Sun. After the Earth, We'll skip Mars, it has a couple of very tiny planets. We'll jump out to um, Jupiter. Now Jupiter has a really fantastic, fantastic um, system of moons. There's four large moons, larger than a thousand kilometers. Um, they, again, orbit in the same direction, in the same plane as Jupiter orbits, and that plane is very close to the ecliptic. Again, there's this direction that's the same between the planets, the plane that's the same between the planets, and even the moons of Jupiter are following it. And uh, as we can zoom out here, we can see that the orbits of the planet, of the, of the moons of Jupiter, are in the same direction as Jupiter is orbiting the Sun. After Jupiter, we come to Saturn. Saturn, another very, very, very cool system. Lots and lots and lots of moons. Six of them, five of them, greater than a um, hundred, a thousand kilometers. And Saturn, as we saw before, has this amazing ring system. And the ring system is in the same plane as the orbit of all the all the moons. And again, the moons are all orbiting in the same direction. Um, now the plane of 
um, Saturn's orbits and the, the plane of the, uh, of the rings is tipped relative to the sun, um, uh, relative to the ecliptic, not by a lot, but by enough to make it beautiful to look at. So that's the Saturn system. Going out from that, we come to Uranus. Now, Uranus was a system that was very strange. The one that has the orbital plane rotated by 97 degrees from the sun. So here we see the planets, the, the moons of um, Uranus orbiting or er, Uranus and tipped 90 degrees from the ecliptic. Very, very different than the rest. Um, we're going to have to understand that as the, as the semester progresses. After Uranus, finally, we come to Neptune. Now, we would have thought that Neptune, how, how weird could it be? And when we get into it, you're going to see that it is actually a lot different than the rest. First of all, its largest moon, Triton, is orbiting in the opposite direction from its second largest moon, Proteus, and neither of them are really orbiting in the plane of the rotation of Neptune or relative to the ecliptic. So something is going on here, Proteus and uh, Triton, the moons of um, Neptune. It's a different system. So we see, can see some patterns in the, in the moon systems um, in the solar system, but these none of these patterns are quite fulfilled everywhere. For most of the moon systems, um, the direction of the rotation of the moon around their planets is in the same plane as the ecliptic, the plane in which the planets orbit around the sun, but not all of them. For example, Uranus is tipped by 97 degrees. Um, others are tipped by 20 degrees or so. Um, for most of the systems, all of the moons go in the same direction. Uh, that's true for most of them. That's not true for Neptune. So there's these patterns which have things that break them. Nonetheless, we need, we're going to need to understand the patterns, what caused them, and why we have the exceptions. So let's go on from there um, to actually look at the moons themselves. We'll start here with Earth's moon. Now, Earth's moon, uh, well, we have three things here. We have Mercury there, then we have Earth and Earth's moon. Earth's moon being smaller than Mercury, but nonetheless fairly large. Um, the Earth's moon is rocky, like the Earth, made of actually much of the same material. Um, we learned this from the Apollo missions. It has no atmosphere. Um, it's got a cratered surface. Now, that's, those things go together, because if you have volcanic activity and if you have an atmosphere, you can eventually wear away um, the evidence of cratering. Uh, the moon has neither of those things, so it is a um, has a very cratered surface. It looks an awful lot like Mercury uh, in, in many ways. That's the Earth's moon. Going out from the Earth's moon, we can go to the to Jupiter's moons. Here they are, Jupiter's moons. Um, Jupiter has a lot of moons, over 60, but only four of them are over 1,000 kilometers in diameter. They're lined up for us here. Um, now, unlike the Earth's moon, which is ma mainly made of heavy elements, uh, Jupiter's moons are, have a very, very high ice content, water and other ices, uh, much lighter. I Io, it turns out, the furthest one there, is the most geologically active system uh, planet, uh, object in the entire solar system. Continuous, large volcanic activity. The surface is just covered with these giant volcanoes. We will have to understand how that works, and I bet we will. After Jupiter comes Saturn. And here are Saturn's uh, major moons. There's five of them, larger than a thousand kilometers. Again, very similar to Jupiter. These um, these moons all have very high ice contents. Now, a particularly special one is Titan. That's the yellow one. It's got the thickest atmosphere of any moon in the solar system. Um, probes have been, there, a probe has been to Titan and landed on it. Um, it actually, in fact, below that thick atmosphere, it has oceans of liquid, um, liquid methane and rocks made of ice in, and, and it rains liquid, uh, liquid methane. Um, all of the moons, of Saturn orbit in the same plane as Saturn's giant and fantastic rings. After Saturn, we have Uranus. Again, there's four moons over a thousand kilometers. Uranus's moons um, smaller than the other ones, uh, but they have a very high, again very high ice content. Um, rotate in the same plane as orbits as Uranus's um, rotation, which is tipped 97 degrees to, from the ecliptic. So the moons of Uranus, and finally. Um, Neptune's lone large moon, only one over a thousand kilometers in diameter, it's Triton. Triton is this weird moon that is orbiting uh, Neptune in the wrong direction. Um, 
The surface of Triton, very, very cool, is made up, made up of mainly frozen nitrogen. Now remember, nitrogen is the primary component of Earth's atmosphere. So on Earth, it's the primary component of air. On Triton, it's so cold there that the nitrogen becomes the rock. So if you were to like stand on nitrogen and the heat went through your boots, it would turn the rock you're standing on into gas. So maybe not a great vacation home, but nonetheless, Neptune is very cool. Um, Neptune's moon Triton, very, very cool place. And that's a, it's a pun because it's incredibly cold. All right, great. Neptune's moons. Next, we can talk about the dwarf planets. The dwarf planets are much smaller than either the um, Jovian planets or even smaller than the terrestrial planets. There have been nine identified. The most famous, of course, is Pluto. Uh, Ceres being another um, dwarf planet we've known about for a very long time, though for a long time it was considered to be an asteroid. It recently got a promotion to dwarf planet. Um, only Pluto and Ceres have ever had any uh, probes visit them, so we know very, very little about the other dwarf planets, although we expect that there may be hundreds of them. Now, the dwarf planets, they all orbit the sun. They all orbit the sun in roughly the same direction as the rest of the planets, but they tend to have much more elliptical orbits, and uh, their, their orbits are tipped relative to the ecliptic, as we saw before. Uh, the dwarf planets, there they are. The next thing we want to talk about is the asteroid belt. Now, the asteroid belt is a region of space in between Mars and Jupiter in which there are millions of small rocky objects. The large of, largest of them is Ceres, uh, the dwarf planet we just mentioned, but there are millions more than that. Um, around a million asteroids that are larger in a than a kilometer in diameter and then get even smaller. Now, even though that sounds like a huge number, um, it's not a lot of mass, only 3% of the mass of the moon. Now, some of these asteroids have been visited by, by probes. Um, for example, um, here we have, uh, 25143 Itukawa, which is um, one of millions of smaller asteroids. It's only about 330 meters in length. It was visited by a Japanese probe in 2005. Um, it actually managed to return samples to the Earth from the, from the asteroid in order to, uh, to study them. So the asteroid belt, millions of small bodies like this one um, orbiting the, the sun in between Mercury and Jupiter. Now, when you're in the asteroid belt, you can't really tell. These, there's so little material, even though it's millions, space is so hard, so huge, um, you can't really see one asteroid from the other. So nothing like science fiction scenarios where you're going through an asteroid belt and dodging all these uh, rocky objects. It's these, these are much, much further apart, much, much less dense. Nonetheless, millions of objects orbiting between Mars and Jupiter. Outside of the order of outside of the orbit of Neptune is another belt called the Kuiper Belt. This is a vast collection of small icy bodies, um, basically kind of like little chunks of Pluto. In fact, Pluto and the other um, dwarf planets out there are part of the Kuiper Belt. Many of them are anyway. Um, the total mass is around the same as the Earth's moon. So it's much more massive than the, um, the asteroid belt. But again, the spacing of these objects is so enormous that you could not see one from the other. Two um, Kuiper belt objects have been visited by probes, Pluto, as we've seen, and then another one called um, Arakoth. Arakoth here was visited by the New Horizons probe in January of 2019. Uh, really fascinating object. It's 36 kilometers long and maybe 10 kilometers across. Um, this object is unbelievably distant. It is six light hours from Earth. That, that is to say it takes light six hours to get from this, uh, this object back to the Earth. Um, so imagine when if you're trying to run a probe and you send a command, it takes six hours for the command to get to the probe, six hours for the answer to get back as 12 hours when this probe flew by um, Arakos, uh they had to make sure it was right because it goes by it takes the pictures and it's gone past and then six hours later you can see if it worked and by then it's much too late to do anything so very fascinating objects there are many 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 objects out past the order of orbit of neptune like this um, 
Of course, only two of them have been visited. The final object in the solar system I want to be talking about are the comets. So we talked about the asteroids, which, or which mainly orbit in between Mars and Jupiter. These are rocky objects. We talked about the Kuiper Belt objects, um, which are these icy objects orbiting out past the orbit of Neptune. There's another class of objects called comets, which are in highly elliptical orbits. They spend a lot of their time in the outer reaches of the solar system where it's very, very cold. Then they come in getting close to the sun. And as they get close to the sun, um, they get warmed up and they emit these, uh, these, these tails. So here's a picture of the comet um, 103P Hartley. And this image was taken by the by the deep impact probe back in 2010. It flew close, it flew right past this thing. You can see the gases and things coming off of the um, off of the uh, comet, which make the long tails. Um, highly elliptical orbits come close to the sun and then shoot back out again. So we've done now a tour of the solar system. We talked about the, terrest the four terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. The four Jovian planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. The jo Jovian planets much larger than terrestrial planets in different composition. We talked about the moons of all the planets, uh, which orbit, orbit the planets. And finally, we talked about the other bodies in the solar system. The dwarf planets, the asteroid belt, the Kuiper belt, and the comets. Now, how do we know all this stuff? We know all this stuff largely because we have sent probes to most of them. Um, this is a, an enormous undertaking. These distances are unbelievable. So I, I want to talk a little bit about one of the very cool probes that were sent out, uh, the probes called the Voyager probes. These were two um, probes sent out in the late 1970s. Now, we talked a bit about earlier about how the orbits um, the relative positions of the planets are continuously changing, and sometimes the relative positions are great, so you can actually send a mission, and other times they're not. It was noted that in the late 1970s, the alignment of the Jovian planets was going to be just right, so that a single mission could visit all four of the Jovian planets. That meant they had to launch by the right time in order to, to catch them all aligned. So let's go back and look at this again. Voyager was launched from Earth, slingshotted past Jupiter, past Saturn, and then passed Uranus using the gravity to redirect it so it could again finally pass Neptune, continuing on away at 16.2 kilometers per second, much faster than a bullet travels. Now, apparently, there's some sort of demo prepared, prepared for us. Ah, me again. You have something for us. That's right. I want to bring Voyager in so we can get an idea of just how big it is. Well, how are you doing that? No, it's... You'll, you'll see. What? We're going to bring it in. Are you, so you got it? OK, start bringing it down. Good. Okay, slow down. Okay. What? Keep it coming. Keep it coming. Okay. Ready? Hold on. And stop. Perfect. All right. So here we have the Voyager. Here we have the Voyager space probe. Uh, this this probe is currently the furthest man-made object from the Earth. It's out well past the orbit. Like of Pluto. many, many yeah, you light. Have to, you okay. Have to yeah. The, the distances. Right. So. But how are you doing this? Like it doesn't. Well, NASA has it available for download. Download. NASA downloaded the model. Download. Yeah. I, so it's pretty cool. You can just put it in your street like this. Yeah, I... Uh, yeah. Okay, right. well... Well, thank you. Thank you, me. Well, there we have it. The Voyager space probe. Fantastic. So, how do we know all these things about the planets? Because we sent probes to visit them, to take pictures, to make measurements. So today we've done a tour of the solar system. We've looked at the moons and the planets, the asteroids, the comets, the Kuiper belt, the dwarf planets. And as the pro semester progresses, we'll be digging in much deeper, trying to understand some of the, many of the things we've, we've seen today. What is the reason for the elliptical orbits of the planets and the moons? What is the impact of the tilt of the orbital axes, of the rotational axes of the, the planets like the Earth? Um, why are the compositions of the distant moons different than the compositions of the terrestrial planets? It's going to be a really fun semester. We're going to learn a lot, and I'm looking forward to next class. Thanks.